Come on up. Come on. Come on down. Um, it is great to be here tonight. And um, as Matt said, I'm Kelly Hoey. I'm one of the three co-founders of Women Innovate Mobile. We are a tech accelerator. So we are early stage um, funding um, through a mentorship driven model of early stage ventures. We look for high growth ventures in mobile and we want to see diverse founding teams. That's where we are distinguished from other accelerator programs. We're excited to be here tonight because one of the things accelerators do is introduce startups to people like this. The, the investors, and tonight we've got, um, I'm going to say, five amazing venture capitalists who are going to introduce themselves and tell you uh, how long they've been in venture and what they're focusing on. So, starting with you, Gene Sullivan. Thank you, Kelly. Gene Sullivan. I'm a co-founder and a general partner of Starvest Partners. Not that it should matter, I love to share, but we are three women founding partners, and we have our one trophy male, and believe me, <laughs> he will wear a dress if we ask him to. <laughs> the best way I can describe myself and my real love is my Twitter description, which says, a passion for the entrepreneur, especially the woman entrepreneur, and a few good men. And I do love it that guys come up to me and say, hey, will you help me? But I uh, found uh, what happened was, uh, although today we're talking about both men and women entrepreneurs, that there's a real uh, wonderful initiative that I call the Women's Conversation. And so there's many of us who are really passionate about helping, this is both men and women, helping women entrepreneurs make it happen. And a quick uh, a walk around the block for my journey is I always was a great lover of technology and uh, my uh, early life was in the wonderful world of advertising, which is a great foundation for packaging and marketing companies. And then I had a wonderful tour at AT&T and Bell Labs. And I see one of my fabulous colleagues here tonight, who I really uh, learned so much from. And we had so much fun building a business. And uh, then that uh, uh, led me to a great, wonderful world of um, investing in companies for Olivetti, the great European company that was smart enough to realize that investing in uh, great tech companies in the U.S. was a good idea. And during my tenure of just uh, seven and a half years, I was able to be part of 40 early stage growth tech companies. What an experience. And so, and I counted in my life, I've been part of investing in 100 technology companies. And at Starvest, so that in, in, emboldened me uh, to be uh, confident enough to help start a fund in 98, 99. And we raised um, money from our limited partners then, uh, and proud to say again in 2009. So we're investing from that fund in the expansion stage. And that for us means we like companies that have two to about 15 million top line, all business to business, and we'll invest anywhere in the country, putting anywhere from four to 10 million to work on the first investment. Uh, and uh, then closely uh, being part of that company, being on the board and advising them, let me put it this way, trying to tell them what to do. And uh, <laughs> trying <laughs> being the operative word, Jean. Indeed. And then lastly, uh, because we're in New York and New York's so vibrant, uh, really uh, an eye towards some of these dynamic women-owned companies too. But we'll talk more about that later. Perfect. All right, Joy. My name is Joy Marcus. Um, I'm currently a managing director at DFJ Gotham Ventures, which I think has been around for as long as Starvest, right? We're like pioneers in New York, both, both firms. Um, I'm relatively new to venture. Um, I joined the firm in May of 2011, so I guess I'm having an anniversary. So Happy anniversary. I got a lot of congratulations <laughs> on Facebook recently, so I guess that's what that means. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about DFJ first. Um, we are a seed and Series A investor. Um, we look at very, very young companies, primarily in... Uh, the industries that I, th that I think of as endemic to New York City, first of all, we primarily invest in New York City. Um, so the companies we invest in almost always have either their headquarters or a substantial number of people based in New York City. And we invest quite a bit in, in, in 
sectors that I think are endemic to New York, sectors like fashion, uh, advertising, fin financial technology. Um, New York has you know, just a wealth of people with the right skills to build those sectors, and we're seeing great success in those areas. Um, this sort of level of investment ranges from like 500,000 all the way up to 2 million, and we always reserve for more money if you need it. Um, that's sort of the range that we invest in. My personal background is I had absolutely no love for tech, <laughs> um, but I really yes. had a major love <laughs> for music. And I started my career uh, at MTV Networks, actually, where I spent quite a bit of time. Uh, run, uh, eventually uh, running the international development group there where I moved uh, MTV kind of all over the world. Um, very hard to do when you're pregnant. I did that twice pregnant. Very fun being pregnant in South Africa, starting MTV in South Africa. Uh, and then I sort of looked at MTV and I said, boy, they are not getting digital and we are losing, and I, there, I am just not powerful enough in this large organization to change that, so I jumped out. And uh, I had a career that spanned, uh, I was at barnesandnoble.com, took it public, then I went to AOL, and most recently, I ran the US market for a company called Daily Motion, which Yahoo just tried to buy from Brands Telecom, who I sold it to. Um, uh, but even Marissa Mayer could not get that deal done, shame. Uh, but it's quite an asset. It's the number two video site in the world right now, and someone should take it out of the hands of Fr France Telecom. There, I've said it, and it's going to be on iTunes, right? So now I'm really, really, really in trouble. <laughs> so, we'll get this podcast. This is right all away. public. It's all public. It's all public information. Uh, anyway, so that's me, um, and that's our firm, and uh, be delighted to meet some folks afterwards. Ellie. Great. Uh, my name is Ellie Wheeler. I'm a VC at Graycroft Partners. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Graycroft. We're based in New York and Los Angeles, and that is aligned with our focus on digital media. Um, so certainly there's uh, both New York and LA are big media hubs within, within the country, obviously. Um, but digital media is one of those terms that now means quite a lot. So, and we take a very broad definition to it. So it's traditional things that you would think of like content, but it's also commerce kind of up and down the stack. And what I mean by that is, you know, it could be enabling technologies, payments, um, a variety of different things. We also do a lot in ad tech. Um, and marketing, uh, marketing services and SaaS. Uh, so we take a pretty broad approach to digital media. Um, but we also, we're focused on Series A. Uh, we do a handful of seed investments, but really it's Series A and a, and a few Series B if the rounds aren't too large. Uh, but we'll invest anywhere from a few hundred thousand dollars to about five million. Anything above 500,000 is gonna be kind of in the Series A bucket versus seed. Um, and for Series A, what that means for us is that there is some form of commercial traction in the business. And what that is is going to look differently depending on kind of the business model and the sector that the company's operating in. Uh, so if it's a B2B company, it means that there will be customers. There will be people that we can call and reference. Um, if it's B2C, there's going to be enough of something to make you believe that it, you know, the concept is going to work. So maybe it's revenue, maybe it's users, maybe it's page views. It's, gonna, it's going to differ. Um, and then myself, I've been kind of on the investing side for about the last 10 years in, in variety of roles. So starting off in more traditional finance and a private equity background. And then I decided that was boring, moved to California, started working at Cisco. Um, I was focused on the enterprise software side, but was doing kind of strategy, investing, and um, acquisitions. Um, then I ended up going back to business school, and while I was there, I was working with an angel investor out on the West Coast, doing a bunch of seed investing in e-commerce and digital media. Um, and then I ended up at Graycroft, so I've been at Graycroft for about two years. Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathleen Utak. I'm from Comcast Ventures. Um, Comcast gets all its money from Comcast, the big media company. Uh, that being said, we operate as a standalone venture firm, um, completely incented, just like any other venture firm up here. However, we're like a venture firm plus because when it makes sense to bring relationships between our portfolio companies and Comcast NBC, we do. Um, we have a couple different funds. Our main fund has been around since 1999. We're investing um, 
mostly after some monetization has been proven out and businesses are really ready to commercialize and scale, which is normally the Series A plus level, um, sweet spot of about three to 12 million. We also have something called the Opportunity Fund, which I'm very involved with, and that's in doing seed stage investments of about $250,000 um, for US citizens that are minorities. Um, we'll do, uh, we'll invest in all technology except clean tech. Uh, we also invest in consumer healthcare and healthcare IT, which I'm extremely interested in. Uh, my background, I've been on almost every side of the deal. I started my career on the debt side of deals at GE Capital. I was an investment banker. I made an angel investment and then ended up running um, a startup company as a CEO. Uh, that company did well and I sold it to a private equity firm and I've been doing venture the last four years. I've been with Comcast Ventures for about a year and a half. Fantastic. And at the end, Donna Nowitzki, Silicon Valley's Ms. Fix-It. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here uh, all the way from the Wild West. Uh, I am um, an entrepreneur, a former venture capitalist, and an educator. I teach marketing to engineers at Stanford University as well. Um, my, I uh, spent nine years as a VC with a Sand Hill Road firm called Moore David Owl Ventures. Moore David Owl uh, is primarily focused on the tech sector, uh, has done some work in clean tech and life sciences as well. Uh, they do mostly early stage investments. My role there was kind of an unusual one. I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to get into when I joined the firm. Um, but as one of the GPs put it, there are hunter gatherers and there are cultivators. And I quickly learned as I got into venture that I'm more of a cultivator than a hunter gatherer. And so my role there became, uh, as a venture partner, was to help uh, the companies that MDV funded get started. So it was kind of like, Here's $3 million and Donna for six months, she'll help you get started. So I, uh, depending on, uh, I, left, uh, I left that about six years ago and went back to my entrepreneurial roots um, with a, a company called Big Tent, uh, which we sold to Federated Media in 2010. And now I'm the CEO of, depending on how you count it, either my third or my 19th startup. Um, <laughs> which is called YIFTE, Y-I-F-T-E-E, and it is kind of um, uh, social gifting meets shop local. Um, and I'm uh, thrilled to be here, and uh, my investors are half on the west coast in Silicon Valley and half on the east coast here in the hub of retail and media. Oh, well, I think we'll have to talk about that too. So one of the things that always comes up with, um, I would say, entrepreneurs in startups is the pitch and getting it right, and you're looking at me, Jean, and I know you've, you've got something on here. What do you want to hear in that first you know, five minutes, Jean? What do you want to hear? Would you just get it out your mouth? I mean, 20 minutes in, you have no clue what the heck the product is. How about 45 minutes in? I'll stop them at about five and say, uh, you know, rewind the videotape here. But uh, really, uh, right next to that is, they want to show you a demo in the first one minute. I hate that. Here's why. We're talking about the business of the business, not the features and functions. And sure, a demo is important, but I want to know how you're going to build the business. And then save the demo for a little bit later, but don't be so hung up about the features and functions. It's so important to really teach us how you're going to build it. Kathleen, you had, a, had an interesting remark on that first five minutes when someone comes in to meet you, what do you want to learn in that first five minutes? Yeah, um, I always want to know about the person and who I'm talking to, especially in early stage investing. You'll say it really matters about the team and the people and what they're going to build. A lot of people, their businesses evolve, so I ask them to tell me about their background and then the genesis of the idea. I want them to be really passionate about whatever they're doing. I don't want them to be creating something just because you know they're trying to sell it for a billion dollars. Why does the world need what you're doing? You know, like, we, we see, especially as seed stage investors, we do see a lot of teeny, iterative kind of product ideas, um, which are fine and probably have a place in the world, but we probably, as venture capitalists, won't put our money in them. Um, what I like to hear, and passion is like the number one thing. I love a passionate entrepreneur as long as they can get stuff out of their mouths quickly. So I think both <laughs> those things combined are ideal. But really sort of 
has someone thought through why would someone want to use this? Whether it's a B2B play, why would a, you know, an enterprise want to use this product? Why would a person want to use this product? What problem, you know, what problem are you solving? In our little thing that we fill out, you know, I'm pretty new at this, so I still use the forms. In the little <laughs> thing that we fill, we do actually fill out forms and keep everything in track and it goes into a database. In the little, in the little form I'm filling out as I'm talking to a company, there is a section that's called what problem is this solving, which I love. It's my favorite section that I have to fill out because if I have not gotten to that question in the meeting, I know it's like a really bad meeting. So to me, that's like the primary thing. I just was, I'll just shut up in a second, but I was just in Tel Aviv and, you know, Israelis are great innovators. I mean, there's a country, whatever. I mean, whatever. No political statement here, just like it's, it is an innovative place. And so, and we look at companies in Israel that are that are mostly that are looking to set up headquarters in New York of some kind. Um, and I was just there, and I had so many entrepreneurs come to me and say, "Look, look at my product. Look what it does. It shakes. It wiggles. It." And I'm like, "Why? Why does it do that? Who wants that?" And you know, not so many had an answer, frankly. Can I can I add something to that? Um, so, venture capitalists, their job is to make money for their limited partners. So when they look at a deal, they have to weigh the risk involved with that deal with the economic potential for that deal. So I would say in your first five minutes, you want to make sure that you have articulated how big the opportunity is in money. And because it's, you know, it's their job to earn money. And that number has to be big enough to compensate for the amount of risk in the deal. And uh, VCs have... Uh, a bias towards making an investment if they believe it's a big enough opportunity because it's much worse to miss out on the next Facebook than to lose three or five million dollars in something that doesn't work. So if you present an opportunity that's big and get them really excited about it, that's kind of what you want to establish in the first few minutes of your meeting. Cool. Ellie. I just like in the, the what, sure. what you know, like first five minutes someone meeting with you how do they make the right impression it's a combination of what everyone said so it's you know kind of what is the problem you're solving is that a big problem and why are you the right team to solve it so I actually think it's really that's it can be succinct and quite simple but that's that's challenging to do as an entrepreneur to really because you're in the weeds every day you know and you're really excited about that feature that the team pushed over the weekend and mm -hmm. you know there's all of these little things that you're super excited about and that's great but having having the discipline to kind of think a little bit higher level and practice the pitch enough so that you can succinctly say you know, kind of, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, this is the problem that I'm solving, and this is the unique experience that we bring to the table, which is why we're going to be successful. We, you know, our, I just, our firm has a tagline that's extraordinary entrepreneurs, big opportunities. Those are like the two things we look for first. You know, who are the people sitting in front of us, and is this, is this big enough? And I just want to, I'm looking down at um, the line at Donna because I'm so glad you mentioned in terms of what venture capitalists are looking for and looking for that return because you need to understand, or in terms of speaking to investors, are you speaking to a venture capitalist or are you speaking to an angel investor? There's two different things there. And knowing that venture capitalists are looking at that return to their limited partners, you need to remember with angel investors because I know... Um, uh, Kathleen talked about making an angel investment. Angel investors are investing their own money, and you've got to understand that that difference. Um, so with everything that's getting fired out there, we were talking in the back about this, and we want to make this really fun. Okay, let's, we, we'll, we'll go down the line once, then we'll go down the line twice, and then we'll, we'll talk about what, may, like, what makes you cringe. Jean? So you know how Donna talked about how we want to make money, and you do too? Well, guess what? If I get blank stares <laughs> on, hey, what's the pre-money valuation, or anything about top line or gross margin, you need to do better there. That's for both the girlfriends out there and the guys. I'm going to go off script. Is that OK? You're allowed to go off okay. script. I didn't mention this back there. Um, the biggest thing that makes me cringe, I just thought of it, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things that makes me cringe is when someone says, oh, I built this last night. 
you know, I built this in 24 hours. I'm like, really? So I'm going to put my LP, the money that other people have entrusted to our firm to give a good return into something you built in 24 hours? I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I That's don't a good think one. so. I like that Go one. back. Yeah. Think a little bit more. Um, for, for me, it's, um, it's being cagey about giving information because you're so tied to the idea and you're obsessed with the fact that the idea is everything, um, when at the end of the day it isn't about the idea at all. Uh, it's really about the execution. And you, it's so often that just even casually at events, people will tell you one line, but they don't want to tell you anymore because it's, it's very secret. And it's just, it's infuriating. <laughs> It, you know, it's really hard when people fail to prioritize. You only have so many resources, um, whether that's time or money, and so you really have to just focus, and that would be great. So my pet peeve was when I was watching pitch after pitch after pitch was product, product, product. Um, and what I mean by that is um, entrepreneurs that get up and just the answer to every question is related to the product, and they want to show product demos, and they want to talk about technology, and I never get a good sense for what the business is. All right. Back to you, Jean. I know that you've got more than blank stares on the financials. And I know you do. King off of what Donna and Ellie just told you, guess what? They're so hung up. You are so hung up on the product and features and functions. I haven't heard the go-to-market. In fact, worse yet, you haven't even thought of the go-to-market. So that's important. How are you going to sell this? Are you going to use channels, a direct sales team? Uh, is it a license? Is it a white label? So those things are so important. Then I can believe you're going to build a business and it will scale. I'll do my other one. Go for it. <laughs> Stay on script, Joy. I'm on script. I can't even remember. Um, <laughs> outsourcing tech. In, in some cases... Talk case, about that. Yeah. In, I mean, in some cases, I think, you know, when a company is very, very, very early, it may make sense to, you know, hire a team out in a place where tech is a little bit cheaper, frankly, um, than in New York City, um, and outsource the beginnings of the product. And that can work really efficiently, but if there is no plan, and there, if there's no tech co-founder and no plan for there to be an internal tech, frankly, and product person within the company, that's a red flag for us, or for me at least. Um, we, you know, I should have been more specific, our firm, I mentioned endemic industries to New York. We invest in endemic industries that are inter specifically internet platforms. So tech is very important to everything we do. And without a person sort of running that show internally, it's sort of a red flag for us. Got it. Um, another one for me is, is when, in the course of a pitch, you know, peop they really oversell. And it's overselling in two dimensions, usually. It's overselling on kind of progress within the fundraise. And there's a, it's a fine line because you need to create urgency and you know, get people to act and fundraising is hard. But overstating it and actually uh, you know, setting expectations that are turn out to fall through is, is never a positive. And then the other one is um, you know, related to that. Usually it'll be slide two and there's a certain subset of people that do this all the time. But it'll be slide two and you'll put up a bunch of advisors, you put up a bunch of um, you know, d consultants to the business that you are touting as part of, you know, a core part of your story. And you dig a little deeper and you realize that they've actually spoken once over the last two years. So that's what I mean by oversell. Cringe. Yeah, um, so sometimes people will just say, oh yeah, we're going to exit, we're going to sell for a billion dollars in like five months because it's that cool. And you know, you need Pulling that's an Instagram. Great. Pulling yeah, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. We all want an Instagram. I, and, and people refer to Instagram sometimes, and it's just like how some people are like, I'm gonna drop out of school, and um, and you know, I'm gonna go run this and then sell it, and then it, that only works for very select few people. Um, a lot of it's, uh, some of it's a, a fluke too, and so I really like to see real business models and people that are invested in what they're actually doing and in, in building a business. All right, this one's easy, you guys. Do not show up with a 50-slide pitch, yeah. right? If you can't get your message across in max 20 slides, you haven't done your homework, so think it through. 20? How long? Seriously, max. maximum 20. How many do you want to see? How many pages do you want to see in a deck, Kathleen? 
It depends. Sometimes I don't even want to see a deck, and I, I, I actually do want to see the demo. Uh, depending. <laughs> Me too. I, I, I want to talk to the person. I mean, it depends what, what, they're, what they're selling. Sometimes just talking to the person, having a conversation. A lot of times we don't even get into the deck, and I have questions, especially we're, we're very investment thesis driven, and everyone's in, in certain sectors, so I might know the whole ecosystem. So I want them to answer specific questions and make sure they really understand the market and, and what they're going to do and why their approach is different and why they'll win. Um, um, so I, it can it can definitely vary, but but I don't really pay attention to deck. The only time it's important is if it's emailed to me first, and then and then we decide are we taking the meeting or not. But after that, don't need to look at it. I think um, we often don't use the deck in a meeting as well. But I think the rigor of having produced it is something that I respect. So um, I always look at it either before or after the meeting usually because of the volume we deal with after, unfortunately, if we don't get to it during the meeting. But what I'm looking for in the deck is how the entrepreneur is thinking. Um, it's not, you know, like, are, are they, if there's a problem in the business, are they confronting it head on? That kind of thing. Like, are they being absolutely rational? Are they hiding balls? That kind of stuff. Like, how their logic works, how their mind works. Because what you're, at the stage we invest, we're re very much investing in the person, the passion, the raw intelligence of the person. Right. And that will come out very much in the meeting, but it will also come out, I have found at least, in, in writing. Right. So one of the questions I have here is, you know, how should entrepreneurs approach investors? So can we talk a little bit about, all right, how is the best way for people to interact with you? Like, you know, we're in New York City. It's full of events like this. There's all sorts of stuff getting on. You can talk about things landing in your email box. But, you know, a lot of this, as you've all noted, it's about knowing the person and getting to know the person. What's the best way for entrepreneurs to get to know you? I think it's so critical to have a warm introduction and uh, to not go in cold. Uh, and if uh, one of my colleagues here tonight called me, uh, and said, I want you to look at this deal, we'd look at it. And uh, so I think it's really critical. And so many terrific lawyers are in town, this town and on the West Coast, that so care about the entrepreneur. They're great ways of intro, because we know them all. And so uh, if you're working with one of those who care about entrepreneurs, have them call us or get us in the door. Get that first meeting. But here's another thing, just to embolden you. Do you realize just in Q1 alone, Six billion dollars was invested in 900 deals. So the money's out there. You just have to know how to get the wallets out of our pocket. <laughs> and I'm also astonished when I meet dynamic entrepreneurs, of which I meet many, many, which is thrilling. That's the fun part of this job. And they have no idea how to get that first angel or that seed investment. And so the other thing is to cultivate that angel network and I often say, well, who are your angels? Often they're the person next door or someone you used to work for, or certainly somebody in your business that maybe has exited. And so those are just a few thoughts on how to get that first step in place. I mean, I, it's exactly what I was going to say. So I couldn't agree more. A warm intro is everything. And don't ignore LinkedIn for that. I mean, we, we actually use it a lot when we're doing due diligence, frankly. I mean, we you know, try to figure out if there's someone we know that knows this person from some other life or knows an investor, an existing angel in the company, and we, we call them. Um, do the same for us. Figure out if there's like a second, you know, tier LinkedIn kind of relationship you can take advantage of. Take advantage of your university networks. We love that. Our firm, we happen to actually all be very, very involved in the universities we went to. Um, like very involved, ridiculously involved. Um, so <laughs> Um, to a fault involved. So, no, just kidding. So, um, but you don't even realize how big your own network is, um, and so and leverage that like crazy because a warm intro is just so different. It's just so different. 
So, I mean, that's definitely true. Um, there's also, I think, over the last few years, there's a lot more information out there generally um, about the fundraising process and, and how to do it. And there's a bunch of different resources within the ecosystem that you can utilize. There's accelerators. There's a bunch of different um, community organizations. And there's even meetups and, and all sorts of different resources that are you know, very specific to you know, potentially what it is that you're doing. Maybe it's um, you know, a, a narrow segment of a particular industry. And those are the kind of networks that you need to cultivate as well, because it's, it's your peers who've been through the process and the peer, your peers who understand, oh, these angel investors actually really like this sector. So it gives you a place to start. And there's a lot of blogs out there um, that are really good resources, uh, at least to you know, figure out how to make those first few steps. But ultimately, especially if you're coming to an institutional fund, um, building a relationship over time is by far the best way to do it. It's not always possible, um, but if you're able to kind of start it in advance when you don't need money, just kind of building a relationship, it, it makes everybody a lot more comfortable going into it. Cool. So you don't want to ask about when head down the end there, Donna, when should a company seek venture funding? Because not every company is venture backable. And when, so what are the, I'm just gonna get to like, what is venture backable? And what, and, and, and just kind of talk about that. Okay, um, I'd also really love to add something to yeah, the yeah, last please do, thing. Please too. do, please so, do. Um, let me do that first and then yeah. I'll take your next Perfect. question. Um, so uh, I wanna point something out to you guys. Money is a commodity. Really great entrepreneurs are very rare. So you need to think of yourself as something pretty darn special. And you need to really look at your potential investors and say, is this someone that I want on my team? Is this someone that I trust? Is this someone that will be a partner through thick and through thin? And if you can say yes to all those things, then go talk to them, build that relationship. But you have to have, you're, you're, you're marrying this person and you're in it for the long haul. It could be, it could take 10 years to run your business or to create your business. That is not unusual these days. And you want that person that's sitting next to you on your, you know, the kind of person that you want to be working with for a very long period of time. And so I would just look at uh, my investment decision from that lens. Um, now, should you even go get uh, venture capital? So the answer to that is the VCs are going to look at, you know, is this going to be a hundred million dollar payout at some point? So is your business capable of having a hundred million dollar payout or a half a billion dollar payout or a multiple billion dollar payout. And if you can't honestly say yes, then you probably aren't looking at the right source if you're talking to the high end um, institutional investors. Perfect, exactly it, and Kathleen. I think, yeah, I think just to add to that, you know, if you have a business, there's some businesses that are better suited to be venture backed and there's so many great businesses, the majority of Great businesses aren't. They're profitable right from the start. There's different business models. They can scale without money. So these are very specific types of companies that we're, we're looking for. And I think you know, if you can go off and build a, a business and keep 100% of that equity and, and you can grow just as well without taking the money, then, then maybe venture is not the right place. Maybe you can look at other capital sources. I think sometimes there's such a hype about let's raise money. I think there's so many great things about venture, but if, if you're this right type of business that really needs that money and where your business makes sense at scale, but for a lot, it's not, and that's, and that's fine too. Yes, it does feel sometimes that we're defaulting to, you know, here's my idea, but to make it happen, you know, I need venture, and it's like, is that really the case? Is there other ways to create, um, uh, create revenue? And I love your point on keeping, um, you know, 100% of your company. Um, and just people know, one of my, I want to say my entrepreneurial crushes is uh, Sarah Blakely. I mean, building a billion dollar business, then this, Sarah is the um, CEO and founder of Spanx, billion dollar business, and she owns 100% of it. I mean, that's, yeah, rare. Yeah, <laughs> sign me up for that one. Um, just in listening to all of you and, 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 and sort of putting on what I know from, from entrepreneurs, can we talk briefly about the no? 
Because I think, you know, you're, you're doing early, you know, and, and looking, I'm going to start with you, Ellie, I was thinking in particular from our conversation in the back, you're meeting people a lot and, and the no the first time is not necessarily, don't darken my door again, I never want to see you, that's a silly idea, blah, blah, blah. It's just no, not here right now. So can you just talk about the yeah, no? Absolutely. So saying, I mean, the vast majority of what we do actually is saying no. Um, rather unfortunately, but that's just the reality, is that there's only a handful of companies that any one of our funds is going to invest in in that given year, which means your day that is stacked full of meetings, most of those meetings are eventually going to be a no. Um, but what you try to do is, you know, certainly we try to be constructive and you try to be helpful with everyone that you meet. It's, a, it's not only a small ecosystem, um, that you know is a very collaborative one, and, and people are often, uh, if that's their first company, and maybe it's not a fit for you from a sector perspective, it's it's highly likely that maybe the next one will be, and, and they'll go on, and they'll be in the ecosystem for many years. So you end up building a long-term relationship. Um, but there, are, so there are times that it is a specific, you know, it's not a fit for for the stage that we invest at, or you know, what we'd really like to see is more proof points on the customer side and. You know, come back and talk to us once you've done X, Y, Z. And and if we're excited about a business, that's more likely what the no is going to sound like. It's going to say, um, you know, this is the specific issue that I have right now. And the way that I would feel more comfortable about it is this. And when that happens, you should definitely you know come back. There are other times that that's not the case, and for some reason it's not a fit. And then that gets us into a whole nother discussion with how we'll do that how that over goes. A drink. <laughs> yeah. No, Joy. I mean I'll I'll I mean sometimes no is really no. I mean right. and and it is it's a really hard thing to do as like a human being to another human being. It's one of the most difficult things I've had to learn how to do a lot in the last two years. Um, and sometimes I really mean it and I try to be very clear in my response back that I really mean it. And all too often people just don't get that signal and I'm inundated in emails and stuff like that. And that's, that's kind of unfortunate because you begin to kind of lose respect. However, many times there are these soft no's where we really do mean come back to us. And that should be, you know, shame on us. Again, we are the commodity, you're the jewel, right? So shame on us if we don't get that message correctly to you. Um, and I, again, I, I'm relatively new at it, so, and I've been trying to craft those messages very carefully. Um, and, you know, it's, sometimes it's very hard to articulate why it's not exactly right now, but you really like the person, you really like the idea, even. You don't like something about what's happening to it right now, and you want to see something different. So, what I'm, it's, very, it's interpersonal skills. Look at the message. Try to read what the person's actually saying to you. We have had entrepreneurs that we turned down in the seed come back for an A, and we funded the A. So it does happen. Uh, back to the long-term relationship, yeah. Ellen. Yeah. Yes. The, the hardest no's and the ones that tend to be most amorphous is when it's, it's something, again, that it can't necessarily be articulated. Yeah. But when it's that, it's often the team. And if you're continually getting a same amorphous, ambiguous no, more often than not, that's what it is. And that's because that's a very hard thing to say to someone. It's a hard thing someone, to yeah. say because they don't necessarily listen even when you do try to say it. I mean, that is just a tough message to deliver. In some cases, it it is the right message to deliver and maybe there's a solution. I mean, usually you're offering a solution if if you're going to deliver that message because you're very excited about it and you know maybe you have some some executive that you think really could fit the bill but if that's the pattern that tends to be what it is so i love to share the solution with groups like this i really believe if you are not the long-term ceo but you have the fire in the belly you're the person who founded the business who has the idea maybe you're the technical lead that it's appropriate to say right there, you know what? I am the person who really believes, has built this, had the idea for many years, but at the right moment, you and I together can find the right CEO to help scale the business. Boy, that takes away a lot of both grief and can change the game right there because you're not sitting there the whole time as the investor saying, how am I gonna displace this person? And you can then more or less 
displace yourself and become the chairman or chief technology officer or strategy uh, VP, a variety of other roles that might be far more appropriate than leading the team to victory. Well, and the best VCs will tell you that if they say, you know, I really like this business, I like this idea, I think you're great to get it started, but my expectation is we'll want collectively to bring in another CEO as this thing takes off. And they should tell you that up front and make sure that that's okay because that's part of the partnership that I was talking we, about. We, we have those conversations often, I would say. And the most interesting thing, again, that I've learned in the last two years is the most important thing is to see the reaction on someone's face when you say that. Yeah. Because there are definitely entrepreneurs who are very open to it, and there are definitely entrepreneurs who are not. Yeah. And it's like a five-second situation, but you know right then and there what you're dealing right. with. You just do. Right. But it's also, you're not, you're, that's absolutely right. And if, it's, if you like the company a lot and you're really excited about it, that's a conversation you have. If you aren't as excited about it, that's typically not a conversation that you end up having because it's just not worth the strife. So that's kind of what I'm getting at. If, if, you're, if you're really excited about the business, you'll find a way to make it work. And, and it's a series of direct conversations, which is a good way to start off the relationship. Because as you said, it is, it's a 10, it's seven to 10 year thing. If you can't have those kind of conversations, the working relationship is going to be challenged. But. You know, and the person who starts the business isn't necessarily the one to to, to, you know, founding a business is different than growing a business and scaling a business and different skill sets and whether or not you have both. And sometimes you find that, you know, it's that unique situation. Um, my kind of, kind of final question before I turn it over to the audience, since we have, um, we can do a little East Coast, West Coast here. And we have, um, uh, I'm going to say, well, you're- I may you're, need some reinforcements. Well, you do. <laughs> I mean, you know, Joy and Ellie and, and uh, Kathleen, they all have offices on the West Coast. You, you get to, okay, so we got true West Coast on that end. We got, I got the New Yorker down here, you know. Um, what, you know, because there's, there's almost always, it's almost like you find people on one coast or the other, they really want that investor from, oh, I really need that Sand Hill Road investor, or someone on the West Coast, like, I need to meet some New York investors. Is there any difference? Like, what, what, what's, what's going on, on out there in, in, so, in well, the so, mindset of uh, Silicon Valley investors? So I think it um, depends on what type of business you have. So my observation would be a lot of the West Coast investments are things that are spinning out of Google or Facebook or one of the enterprise software companies or semiconductors. Um, and that is where a lot of the depth of expertise is networking, equipment. Security is kind of in both locations, I would say. Um, and then out here in New York, you have fashion, retail, advertising, and of course there are exceptions to this generalization all over the place, but you know, look at where the expertise is and you want investors, I think, there. So for my current company, I have half my investors in Silicon Valley and half of them here in New York. Part of that is look at where your customers are too. I mean, it gets at the same point, but if you're selling something into advertising agencies, that gives you your answer. You should probably, you know, you're going to need an office in New York. You're going to probably want people with a strong network in New York. And if you can do that within your investor base, it's probably a good way to go. And if you're at the seed stage, most of your investors are going to actually want to be, you know, just a block away from you. So you can stop by their office. They can stop by yours. You have a problem. You can catch up. There's not a three hour time difference. So normally in the earlier stages, you'll find the investor where you're located. Do you have, have you had companies or asked them to relocate? Uh, we've had companies that they know they're in a kind of odd locale, and they said depending on where they get funding, they'll either move west, go, you know, to San Francisco, or they'll move to New York. Um, and, and a lot of people are open to that, especially if you're coming from other parts of the country. Yeah, and, uh, and other parts of the world. We're starting to see a lot of companies coming from um, all parts of Europe, a little bit Latin America, and as I mentioned before, um, Israel. Uh, wanting to set up shop in New York, mostly because they're in an industry that they feel fits in New York for whatever reason, finance, fashion, commerce, one, advertising, um, but also for the time difference, because often their tech folks remain back home and they're bringing the sales and marketing, and often the CEO will move to New York, and the time difference between 
the West Coast and those locations is really onerous. Whereas the time, to, it's, I, I mean, I ran a business that was, the, or my board was in France and my tech team was in France. And it wasn't so onerous. You know, six hours, there's like a, you know, there's a common work day at least. Right. Um, and in fact, you could get on this sort of 24 hour work cycle if you wanted to, which was actually very productive. So I, I think there are some advantages to New York for companies like that. We're seeing a lot of that now. Cool. Anything to add, Jean? You always have a comment. We blame the entire tech bubble on the West Coast <laughs> for getting those valuations <laughs> way up there. Okay, so is that the difference? Are the valuations higher out there? That and they drive and we don't. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Shall we? There's got to be questions out here. Oh, yeah. We got questions. We got questions. Um, I have a question about the way you said you give someone a soft no. You, you really want them to come back. Do you give them a specific goal, like come back when this thing happens? Because I'm just wondering if it's up to them to come back to you, like are, are you doing any follow-up? Are you watching them? Or what, or what happens if all of a sudden they get some breakthrough and you passed on it and your boss is like, why'd you pass on, you know what I mean? Like, how, how is the follow-up supposed to work? What sort of best practice when you give that soft note? Kathleen, I can, yeah, I can see you got to answer. Yeah, normally I'll tell people, you know, it's just not ready at the stage we need. Send me updates. And I would say the best entrepreneurs will send like every six weeks updates or if anything major happens, we'll send the news article. Um, and also, I'll take notes, so I, I might be tracking people for like three years, and I have notes from the first meeting of where they were expecting to get to, and then these updates are great, because if they constantly say, I'm gonna hit you know, A, B, C, and they, I'm gonna hit all these milestones, and then they really hit all the milestones, you know, meet them or exceed them, then, then that's really compelling. And so, um, as much as I would love to be able to go to all the entrepreneurs and go, oh, I remember this one, this one, it just, uh, our bandwidth is so, it's so limited, and I need someone that's sometimes more proactive, but a lot of the entrepreneurs that I really love, they're so great about sending updates. So set follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. All right. Um, my question is actually around um, how you coach uh, startups, if any, on their go-to-market plan, um, and especially when the product is already operational. Um, the reason I ask is I, I've been in uh, digital marketing for 16 years and often I'm on the receiving end of these pitches from startups that are either in demo mode or you know, trying to get me to give them money from my clients. And more often than not, um, it, I, I get a lot of undifferentiated monetization models. Um, they don't have a sense of scalability. And I'm surprised because at this stage, I assume they've already gotten funding. They've gotten pretty far along. And so it just, it's interesting to me that you know, they're still in this like, uh, unsure of how to sell the product mode. Right. Well, I, I want to answer one part of that. So when I think you, the assumption often is that a company has been funded. Um, but so everyone knows, in terms of venture-backed startups, um, and this is also applies for angel and, and angel as well. But let's focus on venture. One to three percent of companies that pitch get funded. In 2012, just over 1,700 new entrepreneurs got funded by venture. The number of companies that are venture backable are very, very small. So I would actually say take that assumption off that they have been funded. But let's, let's talk about, I think from the entrepreneur's perspective, how, um, you know, what is, what is, what should, how should they be prepared with a, with a go-to-market strategy? What, what are you saying to people? Or what is it that you want to see that maybe, you know, someone else is going to be hearing their pitch in terms of their go-to-market strategy? Can I take a crack at that one? Go for it. Um, because my job at MDV was figuring out go-to-market strategies, and I worked with 16 different startups. Oh, is um, your qu that is so your question. So, <laughs> yeah, and I teach it. Um, so um, the simple answer is less is more. Um, you have to really know who your sweet spot customer is, and you have to be able to describe the daily life of that person and understand if it... Um, not only ha what problem you're solving, but the, if it's a B2B kind of business, what's the organization around that person? How do they make decisions? Who writes the checks? Um, how do financial decisions get made? Who has the authority in the organization? Kind of all around that. 
and they have to really understand what the pain points are of the customer. If you think about it, what customers care about is not your product. What customers care about is their problem. And so as an entrepreneur, you have to really get in the shoes of the customer and understand what is their daily life and how do you solve their problem. And it has to be very, very specific. And, and you build your, your first reference, your first customer has to become a good reference for you. Otherwise, there's a big opportunity cost for all the effort you put into getting that first customer. Um, from there, from that reference, you can get your second, your third, and your fourth customers. So it's all about choosing the right first customers and making them outrageous fans of what you've done. Thank you. Can we all take one minute and thank Kelly Hoey and Women Innovate Mobile for organizing tonight? Come on. Yep. Thank you, Taryn. <laughs> The event series that you've been having here is wonderful. Um, I actually saw Kathleen speak at the social TV. I'm not sure who else was here at the a couple months ago, spoke on social TV here at Apple. I'd love to know beyond that market and hearing you here tonight, for the rest of the panelists, what industries are you most excited about? And what specific startups within those industries are you like really hot on right now? Sure, I'll start. Um, so one of the areas that I think is very interesting right now is retail technology. Um, and that's usually B2B within retail, actually. I think there's actually a, uh, there's quite a bit of opportunity. Retail tends to be very slow, very slow to adopt new technologies. But they're finally coming around to a lot of things that a lot of other industries have done a few years ago. But there's a, there's a lot of opportunity. So we're investors in one company called Nomi. Uh, which is kind of, they're calling themselves you know, the Omnisure for offline, but what it's doing is kind of bringing offline analytics and engagement eventually. It's, it's really the engagement that becomes more interesting, uh, but it's bringing the, that kind of online mindset to the offline and then empowering the retailer with that information. So there's things like that that are really interesting within retail tech. Um, the other thing that I'm increasingly spending time on and learning about is uh, quote unquote, internet of things. So really connected devices and what, what you know, this is just at a macro level, it's, you know, we're all walking around now with sensors every day. I mean, we're all walking around with iPhones, you know, and uh, what does that enable, you know, kind of in our everyday lives when all these devices are eventually connected? I think it's very early in that market, but it's very interesting. Kind of on a, on a whole nother side, we're really interested in uh, consumer healthcare and healthcare IT. I think healthcare, especially in our country, compared to so many others, if you see any of the graphs, our spend is so much bigger. And as you see the, the accountable, uh, uh, accountable Care Act come forward and you see 30 million more people um, enter the insurance system, we think there's a lot of opportunities there. We're really focused on alternative care delivery channels. Um, we also love healthcare services. We have a portfolio a company called Accolade, um, which is great and provides a lot of great cost-saving solutions for, for self-insured employers. Um, so we're looking, uh, if anyone has any ideas in the healthcare space, feel free to send them to me. Other, other than me just being Canadian, giving you ideas yeah. of healthcare? Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Go, Joy. Uh, I, we're interested, I think, in both sectors that the three sectors actually that you spoke about, but um, another, I mean, another big buzzword in the industry right now is big data. Like everybody's talking about it, what the heck is it? I don't really know. But what I do know is that um, uh, at least one, you know, or two star current sort of stars in our portfolio um, have really moved their business models from, you know, something maybe we didn't really understand, but we really like the founder and we are just seed stage investors <laughs> to huge potential businesses based on the data they're collecting. So one of them is called Stella Service. It's basically, you know those like secret shoppers they used to send into department stores when our moms were young? Um, they do that like crazy all over the country. Um, and so they have a huge database on customer service from basically every commerce player in the country, and they're actually moving internationally. Um, and they are starting to become basically the Nielsen, or I don't know, Nielsen's my reference, I did grow up in TV, um, Comscore, whatever, of, um, of, of commerce customer service. Um, and so everyone needs their data. 
How fabulous is that? We had no idea this is where the business is going to head. I have to tell you, we fell in love with the entrepreneur. I wasn't at the front. We fell in love with the entrepreneur, and we thought, wow, this is a really good idea. Like, let's take this on online, all this stuff that's going on offline. That's a good idea. We'll figure out how to monetize later. Now it's this huge data play. So we uh, branded ourselves by being the only venture capital firm that invested in NetSuite which is one of the leading software as a service companies. And because of that, we've invested in more than 20 SaaS companies. But here's what's happened. The big, stodgy, old Fortune 1000 companies now believe in that software as a service model. And that's exciting. They didn't used to. So here's what's happened. Two things that are important to us. Something, a buzzword called the consumerization of the enterprise has occurred, meaning that now you as a worker, a mobile worker, a person that needs to access the cloud for the enterprise has to have new ways of doing that, new applications, new devices. But another really cool thing's happened. The stodgy old HR department has finally awakened and there's some real innovation going on in HR. We had a very successful investment in a SaaS company called Field Glass that was in Chicago. And uh, they innovated in a SaaS model, but now there's lots of wonderful early stage companies that are creating some breakthroughs to do HR better, differently, uh, bring old companies into a new light with new generation look and feel. So that's really exciting to us. Okay, I'm hearing a lot of B2B. Is that where we're at right now? No, is, I, I can yeah. talk consumer. Oh, okay. okay, so there's consumers, but I'm here. I mean, am I hearing a lot of hearing a lot of B2B here? Um, I I think we have a mix in our portfolio actually. Yeah. Um, I where we like. Uh, I well, I like and we like. I think businesses that help consumers discover stuff faster, better. Make it make sort of their lives very, very efficient. We're looking and will likely pull the trigger on investment in that space, I think, sometime very, very soon. Um, we're looking at a lot of different companies. There are a lot of companies, um, sort of Tumblr like um, companies, if, that help folks discover what they want faster, better. It's kind of a messy world out there, and I think discovery is a frontier. No one's been really great at it yet, I think. Um, and I think so there's, there's an, and we also like really um, sort of white space consumer markets. Uh, we recently invested in a company focused on the financial lives of professional women. Uh, that is growing like weeds. It's called Daily Worth. It's, you know, Great teeny, female founder. Teeny right now, great, great female founder. Um, but we invested in, really, the investment thesis there was big white space advertisers. It's a total advertiser, traditional, almost media business. Um, but it was a big white space. Advertisers actually couldn't access these women efficiently, the younger versions of these women especially, efficiently. And um, Daily Worth has created a very, very large community around that. It's very successful in, in getting advertisers to sort of want to access their audience right now. Cool. Kathleen? Uh, no, I was just going to add, Yifty is awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I invest in entrepreneurs. I love Donna after meeting her for just, just a little bit. I, I looked, uh, she sent me a gift to, uh, to a bar we're going to go to tonight, and so I'm excited to actually really use it, so everyone should check that out. I'll send gifts to anybody that wants to join us. <laughs> Um, I work in ad tech. Uh, I also consult for a uh, valuation software company. Uh, and because of that, I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs. And one concern that I don't think that we've addressed here is when, a, when a, I'm sorry, an entrepreneur is seeking funding, they have um, quite a bit of ambivalence around losing control over their company. So um, how would you advise an entrepreneur or um, even how much involvement would you say that you have in either the daily operations or decision making or even the direction of a company that is recently funded? Instead of saying losing a company, think about gaining a partner. That's what I would tell them. Um, someone that could, I mean, everyone says it, would you rather have 100% of something really small versus, you know, maybe 20% of something that's huge or if you even had 
0.01% of some of the biggest companies, that, that's great enough. So I think it's really, it goes to, and I think you were saying, Donna, that you know, money's a commodity, but really what can your partner bring, right? I, I'm biased from being Comcast Ventures. A lot of times we bring partnerships within Comcast NBC, which brings huge value, would be really hard to get if, if the entrepreneur hadn't partnered with us. Um, so I, I, I would try to flip it on, okay, you're, you're really gaining something than losing something. Cool. Thank you for that last question. Thank you, Matt, Josh, Katie, as always, for looking after us and giving us this opportunity.